Well, good morning and Happy New Year to those of you that weren't here last week. It's good to see you. We want to continue to worship the Lord through a time of prayer together. And any of you that'd like to join me in the altar, I invite you to come. But let's let's all go to the Lord in prayer and just ask Him to bless this service. And we'll spend some time praying for our needs. Let's go to Him in prayer together. Father, thank you for uh, the songs that we sing to declare uh, what we believe. Lord, it's what we believe that really make us a church, and, and Lord, we, uh, we thank you for the clear message of your word, of who you are, that you uh, have revealed yourself uh, through your son, and also in your word, and we, we thank you for that. We come to you to, to worship you, we humble ourselves before you, and we, we know that we desperately need you, Lord, uh, Lord, we recognize that we have sinned, and we say we have no sin, we are a liar, the truth is not in us, but if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Lord, we, we thank you for forgiveness uh, in Christ. Lord, we pray that you would help us today as we are uh, people that need help. Lord, uh, there are many sick among us, and we pray, Lord, the prayer of faith that you would heal the sick today, that you would raise people up from their sick bed. Lord, we pray for those that are emo emotionally uh, distraught, those who are have mental uh, illness. We pray, God, that you would uh, heal them, that you would help them, that you would be close to them. We thank you that you are a very present help in a time of trouble, that you are a strong tower that we can run to. And we ask that you would help us, Lord, and we need your help. And God, we also pray that you would fill us with the Spirit today, God, that in cleansing us from our sin, that you would fill the void that is there, that sin used to take, that you would fill us with the Spirit of God, and Lord, that we would display the fruit of the Spirit, that we would uh, display the, uh, the evidence that we are filled with your Spirit, that we would speak the Word of God boldly, that we would uh, uh, share the truth of, of your message, God. Father, we, we ask that you would send us out to the mission fields of the world. We thank you for this group of, of young families that are going to Spain. Thank you that they're here among us. They were at the 830 service. They, they're going to be here for a, a couple of months, and thank you for the opportunity we have to invest in them and uh, as they go out to make an impact uh, among people that are far away from you. And Lord, we pray you'd continue to raise people up from this church family. We pray that you would send the very best people that we have to go to the mission fields of the world to impact darkness to, to share the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ in those places. And Father, we, we ask that you would help the preacher today as he certainly needs much help and that you would anoint him to preach the word of God. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say today. And, and Lord, that as a result of us hearing the word that we would believe and that in believing that we'll have life in your name. And God, that we would go out in your name, that we would live an abundant life and that out of that abundant life that we would impact the, the lives of multitudes of people for the sake of your kingdom. God, may you be glorified and pleased with your church today. Protect us and fill us, Lord. May we sense your presence in this place today. We know that in your presence is fullness of joy. And so, Lord, we pray that, that we would sense that you are here among us, that you live in us, that you indwell us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, if uh, you've got your Bible, go ahead and open it to the Gospel of John. And uh, let me just uh, say, those of you who are, are visiting or guests today, thank you so much for being here. We're so glad that you're here. And after the service, uh, I'm out in this lobby area out here on my left, and the way you're facing be the right. And if you're, you're a guest, I'd love to meet you if you've got just a few minutes before the next service begins. And so stop by there. And if you're a first-time guest, we've got a gift we'd love to... Uh, share with you. And uh, First Connections is at 12.15 today, and we'd love to share lunch with you. I'll be there. I'd love to meet you, visit with you. If you've got any questions about the church, be glad to answer those. So, But we're going to begin a journey today uh, through the Gospel of John. It's going to be a long journey, and we're gonna, we've got it uh, divided up into four, five, six different uh, section sub-series, but I'm excited about us uh, starting this journey in the Gospel of John. 
Uh, I, in preparing for Valiant Warrior that's going to start next Monday, not this Monday, I think there's a football game this Monday night, I think, but anyway, next uh, Monday, uh, we're going to launch Valiant Warrior again. This will be our eighth semester of Valiant Warrior, and I'm going to be talking about the, the, the person of Joseph in the Old Testament, and Stephen Scott, in a book called The Joseph Principles, he tells the story of a woman who lived a very modest life. We would say that she was a, a very poor woman. Uh, she lived, and she was very old, and she was about to die, and she needed to sell all of her things and move into a, a different situation, and she had a very meager cottage. Uh, and as she was uh, getting ready to sell everything, she'd auctioned everything off, and there was a, a picture that was left, and that picture was over the stove, and uh, it, it had accumulated grease and all from the cooking through the years, and but nobody offered to buy that in the auction, and she thought about just trashing it, and, and the auctioneer said, well, why don't you let me uh, just look at it and see, maybe it's worth something, and, and he went, and uh, he had it appraised, and they began to peel back some of the stuff, and they discovered that it was actually a, a quite, a, quite a painting, and, uh, it, and they estimated that it would be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, and so they, they sent it to uh, get appraised in an official way, and, and, and it appraised for over a million dollars. But then when it went to auction, it auctioned for $20 million. And all of these years, this woman had this painting over her stove in her meager cottage, and she died very soon after this, and so she really did not have the opportunity to, to live with the amount of, of blessing, the amount of financial gain that could have been attained by selling that. And I'm afraid that many of us as believers, that we live our lives as paupers spiritually, when we are children of the King, and we have access to an inheritance that, that God has for us in Christ, and we have not tapped into that. We live a, a meager life spiritually, just barely getting by when God has everything pertaining to life and godliness for us, that He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. And as we look at this Gospel of John, there, there's so much in this that is so familiar to some of us. We think of John 3.16. Uh, we think of a lot of the verses that some of us have memorized through the years. There's a familiarity to it, and yet, and, it, and, and there's a simplicity to it, and yet it is so pro profound, and it's so powerful. And so what I want us to do is I want us to go to the back of the book, and we're going to start at the back, and we're not going to work our way from the back to the front, but today we're going to do an overview of the book. And as we look into chapter 20, we see that John has given us the purpose for this book. And as we read through this book, we don't want to lose sight of what the purpose is. You know, you've heard me say this many times, you know, you can drive a nail with a baseball bat, but a hammer works a lot better. And, and there are ways you can do things that we don't want to miss the purpose of the reason that John wrote this book. And so we want to capture it, and you saw the, the title of the series that you may believe, and, and that's the purpose clause, and, and that's the purpose of why John wrote this particular book. So if you've uh, found the Gospel of John, and if you hadn't found it by now, just give up. You, 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 you're not ever going to find it. But if you hadn't found the, if you found the Gospel of John, turn to chapter 20, the, the last verse, verse 31, and I want to invite you, if you're physically able, to stand with me in honor of the Lord as we read his word. And the Bible says this, but these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's true. Thank you that this passage of scripture is so straightforward that uh, you made sure we couldn't miss it. I pray that you would help me to preach your word today, and Lord, that you would change all of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. The purpose is that you may believe. So everything that we talk about and everything that John wrote about is in order that 
you might believe, in order that I might believe, in order that we might believe that, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing in Him that we would have life, eternal life, abundant life, life of meaning and purpose. Let's uh, meet the human author of this divine book. Uh, he is John the Apostle. Uh, he is one of the 12 disciples. He is the beloved disciple, the beloved one. He's the one, if Jesus had a best friend, it would be John. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, he looked out and he saw his mother and he saw John. He said, behold your mother, John, behold your mother and behold your son. And so he gave care of his mother uh, to John. He was also one of the sons of Zebedee, sons of thunder. Uh, he was a part of the inner circle of Jesus, Jesus, Peter, James, and John. And he was also the author of the epistles of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And he was the author of the book of the Revelation. John had a, an elevated position, really, in the, in the mind of, the, of all the, the, the disciples. And, and he wrote these books last. These were the last books that were written, that John lived into his 90s, most likely wrote the Gospel of John first, and then wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then while he was on the Isle of Patmos, that he wrote the book of the Revelation. And so he wrote from a perspective of, of different than the other authors of the Gospels. This Gospel is unique. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic gospels, and that word means seen together, soon, sin, uh, it means together, and optics obviously means to see, to, to see these together. And, and you see many books, I've got a harmony of the gospels in my office that has uh, in, in columns, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke side by side, and you can just see the chronology of those being close and have similar stories. And, and, and John is unique, it has material in it that is not found. Found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, really uh, chapter 2 through 4, is that there are no parables, no narrative parables in the gospel of John. There's no uh, Mount of Transfiguration and, and things like that. So it's unique and it's different in, in that regard. It's a, it's a great book. It's a great study. And one scholar said this, said, John's gospel together with the book of Romans may well be considered the enduring twin towers of New Testament theology soaring to change metaphors as an eagle over more pedestrian depictions of the life of Christ. Scholars would say that it is the most theological of the, the gospel. Certainly, we believe that all the Bible is theological. It is all doctrinal in that regard. But I want us to delve into this one verse of Scripture today. And, uh, and, and really, there are three things you need to remember. Three words. One is word, the others believe, and the other is life. But the first thing I want you to, to see is that belief begins with valuing the Word of God. Belief begins with valuing the Word of God. I probably should say begins with believing the Word of God, and, and I certainly uh, include believing in that idea of valuing. If you notice there at the very first phrase says, but these have been written. These words have been written. These things have been written. The, what John has written has been written for a purpose. But what he's doing is he is giving the importance of the word, the importance of the word of God. It is, this is a good spot to be reminded that for all scripture is inspired by God, 2 Timothy 3.16, that, that the scripture has been given to us and it is infallible, it is inerrant, uh, it is inspired by God, an I cubed, if you want to think of it that way, the three eyes that I believe is, is so important. I challenged you uh, frequently that someone that does not hold to the inspiration, infallibility, and inerrancy of Scripture, you should not listen to them. You should not listen to what they have to say. Maybe you could learn a few things along the way, but, but they are in error that we believe that God has given us his word and that word of God is inspired. And John believed the word of God is the inspired word of God. Jesus Christ himself believed in the inerrancy and inspiration of scripture. And we'll see that as we study this book of John. So we see the importance of God's word, but also it's important for us to see the impact 
of God's Word. It's not just something that's floating around important, but it has an impact. The Bible tells us in Romans 10, 16 that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. That our faith, which is the purpose of this book, he's written these things that you may believe, that you might have faith, and we know how important faith is, and we're going to talk about it in just a minute, a little more in detail. But where does faith come from? You know, people think, well, well, maybe if I just think about it more, or if I just try harder, or I uh, uh, strain, or whatever it might be, that, that I'm going to have this faith. If I just repeat it over and over, I'm going to have faith. No, faith comes from hearing the Word of God. That's where faith comes from. If you don't have faith, the way you get faith is from the Word of God. You get it from reading the Word of God. You get it from listening to the Word of God being preached and taught. You get it by meditating on the Word of God, memorizing the Word of God, studying the Word of God. If you don't have faith, it is indicative of the fact that you need to spend more time in the Word of God. Now, none of us have perfect faith. None of us have a completed faith. But we should be having a growing faith, and that faith grows by the Word of God. So we value the Word of God because the Word of God is what gives us faith. If you want faith, you need to give a priority to your life this year to reading the Bible. You need to give priority to to hearing the Bible preached and taught. And you need to give priority to being in church so you can hear it preached and taught. You don't need to minimize. We live in a day that is unprecedented in, in my lifetime as far as people just blowing off church. I mean, it just, it's so easy to do it. If it I mean, it's just, if there's anything else going on, then, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm going to do that. But, it, but you know, I'll, I'll show up if it's convenient. But I'm telling you, you will not be a person of faith, especially the kind of faith that changes and transforms your life the way God intends to, apart from the Word of God. So you've got to be around the Word of God. You've got to listen to it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. And then in 1 Peter 1.23, the Bible says, For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring Word of God that it is by way of the Word of God that we are born again. If you want your kids to be born again, to come to know Christ, so that when they die, they'll go to heaven, then they need to hear the Word of God. It is the Word of God that is the seed, the unperishable, the imperishable seed, the enduring seed of the Word of God, that God uses the Word. So people are not saved apart from the Word of God. Nobody can be saved apart from the Word of God. You say, well, what about people that, uh, that, that have dreams or visions? Well, I'm telling you, that dream and vision is about the Word of God. That's what it is. Uh, somebody's speaking it to them. They're reading it. They're, somebody's sharing a track that has the Word of God. God has ordained His Word as the imperishable seed, the enduring Word of God. That's why we send people to the mission fields of the world to preach the Word of God. That's why we pay great sums of money for people to translate the Bible into the heart language of people that don't have the Bible in their language. Because we believe and we know the Bible says about itself that it is the imperishable seed of the Word of God and people are born again as a result of the Word of God. And so we, John is saying, I've written these things down. I've given you the Word of God. The Lord Jesus himself identifies himself personally as the Word the Word who was with God and the Word who was God from the very beginning. And so we see the the prominence and the preeminence that, that God gives to His Word. Now, you've heard me say this also through the years. We don't worship the Bible, but everything that we know about the God we worship, about the Christ we worship, is found in the Bible. And so if you've got a faulty book, you're going to have a faulty faith. And so it is closely connected. Jesus himself connects himself to the Word of God. The name of God and the Word of God are elevated in Scripture to be on the same plane, the same level. They're not the same thing, but they are. They, together they bring us to an understanding, to a place where we have faith. It's the Word of God that gives us 
faith. And so we, uh, we focus on that. We give value to the Word of God. It is God's primary way of communicating with His people. We have the spoken Word of God through the prophets of the Old Testament that was written down. These New Testament believers, they had the Old Testament Scriptures. Jesus believed the Old Testament Scriptures that were written down. We, today, we have the blessing of the New Testament Scripture and the Old Testament Scripture, the the, the completed canon that is given to us. And and these things have been written down for our blessing, for, for, for our encouragement, for our salvation, for our edification. And also, it's important for us to believe that the Scripture is inspired, it is infallible, it is inerrant, but also to believe that it is sufficient. The Scripture is sufficient for us, that we don't need anything else outside the Scripture. Because I'm telling you, most of the world, a lot of the world, there are literally billions of people in the world, they don't don't have a lot of other stuff to prop them up. They don't have psychology and sociology and and some places don't even have medicine and things like that. And we thank God for that. And we certainly uh, involve ourselves in humanitarian causes for the purpose of sharing the gospel. But there are places, and I've shared those stories where I've been, and I've been confused about how people just want me to pray for them all the time. And I'm like, well, what's the deal on this? Can't they pray for themselves? Or what's the, you know, I mean, I I don't want them to think I'm some kind of idol. He said, no, no, Pastor, you misunderstand. said, these people, they don't have anywhere. They, they, They can't go to the doctor. They can't go to marriage counseling. They can't go get counseling for, for their, their, their troubled child and things like that. They can't do that. All they've got is Jesus. All they've got is prayer. Folks, the Scripture is sufficient. Jesus is sufficient. The grace of God is sufficient. Now, I'm not opposed to us involving, and we need to be as smart as we can, and we need to do things as, as well as we can, but the bottom line is the Scripture is sufficient for everything pertaining to life and godliness. And folks, I don't know, but that sounds to me like that's just about everything. Everything to life and godliness is found in the Scripture. Jesus is sufficient. The Scripture is sufficient. And so what are these things that are written? Well, we're going to be talking about that in the weeks ahead. And the content of what has been written is so important. And we'll begin next week in the prologue. That's the very beginning, the first 18 verses, a beautiful uh, section of, of, uh, of literature for anyone. But for us as believers, it is life. It is powerful. We see that, that Jesus is in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And, and the Word was the creator. The Word was, was the light of the world. The life was in Him. He was rejected by some. He was received by others. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the, glo- the, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. And then it moves on at the end of chapter 1 to where Jesus begins to call His disciples and they begin to follow Him. And some of those disciples that invite others to come. And then in chapter 2, we, we see the first miracle, the first of seven miracles. There are seven miracles in, in, uh, in the Gospel of John, and the, the wedding of Cana is the first miracle. And then we, we run into the seven I am statements where Jesus says, I am, and really declaring his deity. And we see different aspects. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. <clears throat> I, uh, I am the true vine. And he, he says who he is, and, and what a great story. And then, and then we, we get to the, to the end, and we see the Passion Week. It's really not the end. It's chapter 12 and following. following. In all of the Gospels, there is what we would say is a disproportionate section of the Gospels is given to the last week of Jesus' life. Well, that's for a reason, <laughs> because the Passion Week and the cross are all important to us and our faith. And we, we see the betrayal, we see the arrest and the trial, and, 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 and then we see the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. And then chapter 21, we see these post-resurrection appearances that, that take place. And so that is the content of, of what these things are. It is something to be valued. It's something to be believed. We believe it. We believe the Word of God. The second thing I want you to 
uh, to notice is that belief in God's Word leads to embracing Jesus Christ. Belief in God's Word, and when I say embracing, uh, uh, without being redundant, uh, it means results in believing in Jesus Christ. The, the point of the Word of God and believing the Word is so that you would believe in Christ. It is not just to believe the Word as some type of historical information or just some kind of information in general. It is in order that you might believe in Christ. That is the purpose behind that. Belief in God's Word leads to embracing Jesus Christ. That next phrase, so that, there's the the, the purpose clause, so that you may believe. So that you may believe. Well, does it mean that we believe in Jesus as our Savior for the uh, first time, or does it mean that we keep on believing? I think both are in view here. There's been a de- debate among scholars which one, but as you study the Scripture, you see that, that both are affirmed, but we certainly believe that front and center in the heart of John and the other evangelists, the other gospel writers, that evangelism was at their heart, that they were sharing the message of Jesus so that people would believe in him, so that people would come to know him. And that's really that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And so it is evangelistic in its thrust, but it's also not just coming to faith in Christ, but it's also continuing your faith in Christ. And we as believers, we are blessed and we benefit from reading the gospel of John. We are encouraged, we are edified, we learn and we grow uh, as a result of of being exposed to the gospel of John. And God uses that to continue to transform our lives. So we embrace Jesus uh, by coming to him in faith, believing in him and being saved. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that's how we come to know Christ. It's not by what we do, but it's by who we believe in, that we believe in him, that we trust in him. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him righteousness. But also, it is important for us as believers to walk by faith. Embracing Jesus means continuing with him in faith, and those who have been saved by the grace of God will continue to believe in him and to continue to follow him, and that is sanctification. The Bible tells us in no less than three different places in Habakkuk and Galatians and uh, Romans and, and Hebrews, I guess that's four different places, the just shall live by faith. And that verse I quoted earlier where it says, Abraham believed God and was counting him righteousness. Righteousness and just, they come from the same root Greek word. And so the, the righteous shall live by faith. Those who believe Those who believe God and are given the righteousness of Christ will keep on believing and they will live their life by faith. Hebrews tells us, the author of Hebrews says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So in order for you and me to be pleasing to God, we must be living by faith. The question for you and for me is, how are we living by faith? What part of my life and your life could be characterized as walking in faith. If we have no area of our life that we can attribute to a faith walk, then one thing we can know is that we're not pleasing to God. That it is, our faith is, is certainly not perfect. It is an imperfect, flawed faith, but it should be a growing faith and we should be walking in faith to Christ. So the word of God is given to us so that we would believe. That meant believing It's for our salvation, that believing is also for our sanctification, but also the the content of what we believe is in view here, that embracing Jesus means confirming the content that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And for those Jews of that day, they were looking for a a Messiah, Christ, Messiah, interchangeable there, that that they were looking for a Messiah. They were looking for the long-awaited one, the one that would come and save them, the one that would come and rescue them. It was a part of their tradition. It was part of their teaching. It was part of the Old Testament uh, teaching, the prophecies of old. So they, they were told one was coming. And so what John is saying, Jesus is that one. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Messiah. And for many of them, that's not who they were looking for. You got anybody else out there? He's not the one. I mean, that, that, that was their view. And so John was saying, this is the one. He was clarifying who they were to believe in and, and what they were to believe in. 
And that's so important because we live in a day where everybody believes in something. Everybody believes it. People that even say, I, I don't believe in anything, well, that's believing in something, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, you know, if you believe in nothing, that's something. So does that make sense to you? Are we all getting confused here? You know, who's on first, that kind of thing. But anyway, but, but everybody believes in something. But what you believe, and maybe better said, who you believe in, makes all the difference in the world, makes all the difference in eternity. You can be sincere in your belief, and you can be sincerely wrong. So what we believe and who we believe in is all important. And we live in a day where people create God in their own image. Another thing you've frequently heard me say through the years is that you must believe in the Jesus of the Bible. And I've had people come up to me and say, what do you mean when you say that? Well, what I mean is that people create Jesus in their own image or in what they want or their preferences. And you hear that all the time. You hear it all the time. You hear it from politicians, athletes, and movie stars. I, you know, and uh, that doesn't mean that all politicians, all movie stars, and all actors are heretics. It's just most of them are. But anyway... Uh, but it's amazing to me that we get our instruction from people that have no training, no understanding. And I, I, I believe in priesthood of the believer and, and all that. I'm not trying to create some elitist, uh, you know, uh, clergy and all. But it is amazing how so quickly people miss the, the clear teaching of Scripture. And, 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 and what John is pointing out here, are two things, he's got two things. He's, a, he's the Messiah and he's the Son of God. He's saying he's the Messiah. There's a connectedness to Jesus to the Old Testament. That Jesus isn't Johnny on the spot, just showed up. No, Jesus has always existed. He is the prophesied one. He is the prepared one. He's the one that's been in the heart and the mind of God in eternity past. This has been the plan of God. This is not some emergency, emergency session, uh, try to figure out what to do. He's not, you know, we're not like playing war here and you do this and I'll do that. No, God has already predetermined this is what God is doing. And, and so there's a connectedness and there's a continuity of God's redemptive plan that God has been redeeming for himself a people. And the Old Testament saints, they were looking ahead to Jesus. We today, we're looking back on the death on the cross, but we're looking ahead to his return one day and the culmination of everything. And so there's a connectedness. And so for religious people, he is the one. He is the child. All of this stuff that you've created in your religious idea of going to church or, or paying the tithes or doing this or doing that or doing the other thing, uh, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the appointed one. Jesus is the one, and, and you've got to believe in him. But also, Jesus is the Son of God, and to some some people would say, well, I can take him as Messiah, but I can't take him as the Son of God. That Jesus is deity. Jesus is God. Jesus is the creator. Uh, as Paul said in Colossians 1, that Jesus, all things were created by him and for him and, and through him. That, so Jesus is the creator. And Jesus is all of that. And, and we'll be looking at that in, in John chapter 1 here next week. And so Jesus is God. Jesus is the promised one. They are one and the same. And, and you must believe in him. And you can't believe in anything else but him. And that is the offense of the cross, the offense of the exclusivity of Christ. There is the exclusivity of Christ that no one can be saved except through Christ. There is the inclusivity of Christ that everyone can be saved who will believe in Christ. So there's, but God has made it not a complicated thing, but God has made it a very clear pathway. And John is making it very clear. And so today we cannot create a Jesus in our own image or a Jesus of our own preference or a Jesus who, who overlooks biblical uh, morality and overlooks biblical marriage and overlooks the uh, teachings of Scripture and all of that and, 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 and you know just made up by a movie star, made up by a politician and, 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 and all of those. I could give you multiple examples of how it's just heretical teaching. It's, it's, it's errant teaching, errant speculation. But it's very clear. And, and the amazing thing is what happens is that we make God in our own image, and that's idolatry. 
And idolatry is anything that we put in, in front of God. I mean, it, it can be images, it can be uh, totem poles or trees or statues. Or it can be our recreation, it can be our job, our position. And it can even be something like our family. Now, God established the family. God wants us to love our family, and God has given us uh, ways to do that and told us how to do that and has given priority. And you know, marriage uh, really is a, is a picture to the world of Christ and the church. But the reality is that, that Jesus, there's n- nothing that can take the place of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah, the Savior. No one else is. And He is the Son of God, and no one else is. And the amazing thing is that people from all different backgrounds, all different experiences, all different generations, all different socioeconomic statuses, all different colors of skin, all have to believe the same thing. Hello. All have to believe the same thing. That the diversity out there all has to be brought together to believe this. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That to those who do not believe, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, it is a stumbling block to them. It is an offense. It is a scandal. But to those who believe, it is the power of God. So for those who are believing, when we say that Jesus is the way, you're saying, it should resonate in your heart and your, in, in the, your, the Spirit of God in you should resonate and say, Amen. Amen. Because you know He's real. You know He's changed your life. You know that He's the only way. You know He's rescued and you know the power of the gospel. But to those that are out there and you're, you're sitting there and you say, Man, I'm not sure what, I'm not sure what He's saying is quite right. I think He's kind of gone, gone too far. This morning, you know, he's just kind of gone a little further than what he needs to go today. I'm telling you what, Jesus went all the way to the cross and died and rose again. And he's the one that said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. I didn't say it, he said it. And so based on what Jesus said, and you've heard it said multitudes of times, or some of you have, that Jesus cannot be one way. He cannot be a way, I mean. He cannot be a way. He has to be the only way. Because Jesus claimed that, and he claimed that he was either a liar or he was a lunatic. Or he is exactly who he said he is. He is the Lord. So embracing Jesus means that we uh, confirm in our heart that he is who he says he is. He is God the Son. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. And then... Belief in Jesus results in life in his name. Life in his name. And that last phrase is that believing you may have life in his name. That you might truly know him. That you might be made alive spiritually. John did not write as an academic exercise. He did not write to to give us uh, uh, information but he, he gave us propositional truth, real truth, facts. Jesus stepped into history. He's a real man, real man, real God, all at the same time. But he stepped into history, this propositional truth. And Jesus lived sinlessly, died vicariously, publicly on a cross. And rose from the dead and was seen by multitudes of people to establish the factual, historical nature of what he did. But he was not just a, a, a something of history, but he came in order to change people's lives. And John is not neutral on this. He desires for people to believe, people to have life in his name. Life comes from believing. Life is in his name. And, and we'll be looking next week in the fact that in him was life. In the weeks to come, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. John 3.36 says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You see, Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, and we'll be talking about that in John 3. Because the world was condemned already. The world's already condemned. 
Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. The world's already condemned. Jesus came to save the world. He came to rescue the world. The world will be judged on his, based on his words and based upon the rejection of him. But, but the world is condemned. The world is dead in sin and trespasses. But God makes people alive by his grace. God who is rich in mercy. He causes people to be born again, to be made alive. We'll see in John 3 that you must be born again. We'll see that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. John was not content just to explain a subject, but he was an evangelist. And he desired for people to believe and people to experience life. And so our hope today is that you would love and value God's Word, and that by loving and valuing God's Word, that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, that He is the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, that you would have life in His name. And that's God's desire. That's why Jesus left heaven and came to planet earth. And our hope is that by believing in Christ, that you would be rescued from spiritual death and darkness and you would be ushered into spiritual life and light in His name. If you have not trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior, everyone needs Jesus from the youngest to the oldest. We all need Christ. We were not born good. We were born in sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Jesus came into the world and died on a cross for our sins so that we can be forgiven of our sin. He was our substitute. He took our place, that substitutionary atonement. He took our place and he rose from the dead. He conquered death, the the greatest problem of sin, that sin entered the world by one man and uh, by that one man, uh, death also entered and sin by death, that, that death came into the world. And our biggest problem is death. (laughs) That's our biggest problem. But Jesus Christ solved our problem because the only solution for our biggest problem of death is resurrection and Jesus rose from the dead so that we too can be raised from the dead with him and in him. And so if you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior today, whether you're watching online, whether you're here, whether you're a little boy, a little girl, a teenager, Young adult or older adult, we all need Christ, every single one of us. There has to be a time that we turn from our sin and we place our faith in Him. That's why John wrote the Gospel of John, so that by hearing these things that you might believe, and that by believing you'll have life in His name. Would you bow your head with me right now? If you need Christ as your Savior and Lord. Maybe you're just not certain. Maybe you're not sure. Well, if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven. You don't know whether you've truly trusted Christ, but you want to know that. Today would be a great day for you to nail that down, for you to drive a stake in the ground and say, this is the day. This is the day. If this is that day for you, we believe that God makes it clear. The Bible says now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. I believe that will resonate with you if if God is speaking your heart and leading you to himself today. Would you pray this prayer with me silently as I pray it out loud? Would you say, dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin and I believe that he rose from the dead and I turn from my sin and I trust in Jesus and him alone for my salvation, and I receive this gift of eternal life that I cannot earn and I do not deserve. Listen, if that is your prayer, in just a minute, we're going to stand. I'm going to invite our prayer encouragers to come right now. If you would, go ahead and make your way up here. In just a minute, we're going to stand and we're going to sing a song. As we stand and sing that song, I'm going to ask you to come and speak to one of our prayer encouragers and just share with them. Say, I just prayed that prayer with a pastor. Or you can say, I'm trusting Christ today. It's important for you to let someone know that. It's important. It's too important to keep it to yourself. As a matter of fact, Jesus said that if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. So you just come and just say, hey, I, I'm trusting Christ today. I want you to pray for me. Uh, and you, you may just say, hey, I'm doing what the pastor said. They'll take it from there. They'll help you. They'll pray for you. They're your friend. They're here to help you. If you need to join the church, you need to follow the Lord in baptism, 
you can also come and, and let that be known to these prayer encouragers. Some of us here, we have burdens on our hearts. We have needs in our life. We, we're struggling. It may be financial. It may be uh, with relationship with someone in our family or someone else. It may be a work situation that, that you just need someone to pray for you. Well, this is a, an opportunity for someone to pray for you for the need that you have. And that's what, that's what we're here for. This is a house of prayer. We, we, we all need Jesus. We all need help. And, and we believe that God is our greatest source of help. He's a very present help in our time of trouble. And so we just, we believe that I, I need prayer. We all need prayer. So this is an opportunity for you to receive the prayer that you need, that you're here today and God, it may be your first time here. That's okay. You come and let someone pray for you. They'll pray briefly, not a long time. They'll let you go back to your seat. Church family, I'm afraid some of us, we're like that lady who labored for years and years in front of that multi-million dollar picture, painting, portrait, not knowing that we've got all the resources of heaven right before us and we're, we're living as paupers spiritually. We're just dragging along. And God has so much more for us, spiritually speaking. I'm not talking about you're going to have a lot of money or you're never going to get sick or anything like that. No, I'm talking about even when you don't uh, have a lot of money and even when you do get sick, that, that you have the joy of the Lord, that you have the God of heaven living in you in the person of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Christ is in you. And that's why we believe so that we might have life in His name, eternal life but also abundant life now. For some of you, you may want to come and have someone just pray for you just to drive a stake in the ground say, today's the day, man. I'm going to start this new year in a, a new way. I'm going to walk by faith. I'm going to invest in the Word of God. I'm going to make a commitment to reading the Bible regularly. I'm going to make a commitment to being in, in worship regularly, to, in, in life group regularly, so I can be exposed to the Word of God So because faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Father in heaven, I pray that you'd help us today to please you, Lord. You didn't give us your word to give us information, but you gave it for transformation. I pray you'd change us. I pray you'd change me today through the word of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.